Okay, uh, can I have everybody's attention? Um, I want to introduce our speaker tonight. This is uh, Alex Ignatiev from uh, University of Houston. And uh, let me get this straight. He has uh, joint appointments in the, the Department of Physics, Chemistry, Electrical, and Computer Engineering there at UH. And he's also the director of the Center for Advanced Materials. And so um, also, you know, thanks to our collaborative PhD program for people who are um, interested in working on a PhD in physics, um, he is one of the faculty who you can uh, go through, take your core courses here and work with. He does quite a bit of work with NASA, and he's going to tell us a little bit about the fabrication of thin film solar cells on the surface of the moon for lunar and terrestrial power. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, please interrupt me if you have a question. I'm not proud. Uh, and so uh, I'll try to expose to you uh, our, some of our work uh, that we're taking, uh, undertaking in terms of energy in general. So let's see if I can make this thing work forward and backward here. Do the up and down arrows work, David, or not? Can, can I try it? You're right, they don't work. Okay. So, oh, first of all, my collaborators, here are people that actually did the work. Uh, I just talk about it. Uh, oh, ha. Huh. It doesn't run PowerPoint. Okay. Well, what I, was, what I was trying to show here, number one, is that don't look at the back picture, right? You can't see that picture. It doesn't exist. Uh, but here, in fact, uh, Rick Smalley was a uh, Nobel laureate at, at, at Rice University. He uh, was, in fact, one of the discoverers of buckyballs, he and Curl and Crotus. And um, Rick, in his later years, was interested in, in la large projects, and his large projects were you know, what are the global issues? And you look at the global issues, start at the bottom of population, democracy, education. At the top of the pyramid is energy as the principal global issue in Rick Smalley's mind. And I actually agree with that because we work together in this project. Um, so the challenge is, and if I was able to move this over, oh boy, that's even worse than that. Uh, move it over, what you'd see back there is the standard NASA map of the world at night. Uh, uh, and you'll see that there are many areas in that map that have no light, that are dark, in fact. And in fact, about if you can read down here, about 2 billion people in the world don't have electricity today. So we have to do something about changing that. And the projection is by 2050, if you want to have the, all of the world have a, a minimum amount of electricity, and that's about one kilowatt equivalent. We're running at about 5.5 or 6 kilowatts per person in the U.S. right now. We need about 20 terawatts total of capacity. We've got about 12, 10 to 12 terawatts currently of electrical generating power. So that's, uh, that's 10,000 uh, 10, gigawatts of, um, of uh, uh, electrical power capacity in the world. Uh, you may have, uh, to, to relate that, uh, the, uh, Texas has the largest installation of uh, wind turbines in the U.S. We've got about six gigawatts of wind turbines. Okay. So, um, did I say that right? Yes, I did say that right. So there's a long way to go in terms of the rest of the world. We're talking about things like wind turbines and other things. So, uh, so what do we do? Well, the interest is, let's look at what's, what's going on with solar energy. First of all, uh, where's the energy coming from? All energy we have here on the Earth comes from the sun, period, period. There's, no, there's nothing that's not based on the sun, whether it's now or four and a half million years ago, billion years ago, sorry, it's all the sun. So currently, in terms of energy coming in from the sun, it's about 174 petawatts, okay? Uh, that's 1,000 uh, terawatts, which is a, a million gigawatts. Uh, we don't need much of that. You know, we only need, uh, you know, about 1% uh, about of that. No, a fraction of percent of that to be able to make up what we need for, for I'll say, the rest of the world with electricity. But of that amount, only about half is absorbed by the land and by the ocean. There's reflection, there's the atmosphere absorption, there's radiation, et cetera, et cetera. Now, of that, say, nominally 100, 100 petawatts, so 100,000 terawatts, we only need something like another 10 or 15. If we could capture that energy in some way or other, then we'd solve all of our energy problems. So how can we do that? Well, let's look at, in fact, the sun itself, the solar spectrum. 
And notice the solar spectrum in the visible regime, they have something like 46% of the energy that the sun gives off in the visible range. If we had some way to capture that radiation, or in fact capture the whole spectrum of the solar radiation, we'd be able to take all that, maybe convert it in some way after we capture it, and then generate from that conversion process and electricity for the world. Uh, the way to capture the visible portion is in fact what's been done since 1945, and that's called the solar cell. And solar cells operate really in this regime, somewhere from over the order of, uh, say, 400 nanometers to maybe something like 800 nanometers uh, at, in various, in various, uh, at various efficiencies. Um, and you see there's a, fa a fairly large structure in this curve. And uh, the solar cells are really based on semiconductor junction, a PN junction. And what you have is doping PN and dop NNP doping on the... Uh, uh, that generates a junction, and what, what, why is the junction there? A junction there to separate the electron in the hole that is formed when you absorb a photon. If you don't separate the electron hole, they recombine, and you have, therefore have no more, uh, no, uh, no uh, energy, energy out of the system. So you've got to, you have to separate those electron, the electron in that hole. You can then suck off the electron and use that to do work with. So how do we do it currently? Right. In terms of current technology here, the first generation for the past uh, uh, 60 years or so uh, is silicon. Uh, currently, silicon has increased in terms of uh, panels. Uh, silicon panels have increased in efficiency. In fact, uh, there are some champion ones out there at the 19, 20% level. The commercial ones are still at the 16, 17% level maximum. Uh, and they cost about $3 a watt. This is just for the solar cells themselves, not the balance of plant or balance of the system. A second generation in the last, say, five years, something called thin film cells. It's a misnomer, but nonetheless, uh, it's not a bulk material. It's a deposited material, and these are in the uh, cadmium telluride uh, system, the copper and selenide system, and they are less than 15% efficiency, and they're of the order of a couple bucks a watt. They're a little bit cheaper, but they're a lower efficiency. Therefore, you need more of them, and as a result, you need much more area, much more real estate to be able to do that. Third generation cells uh, are, are three, five, are semiconductor based, gallium arsenide based, and these uh, can work under high concentrations and they have efficiencies that can be relatively high. In fact, uh, the latest um, uh, commercial mark in production is 39.5% production of uh, solar cells in the, in the Indian gallium arsenide system. Um, and per watt, they're expensive, but per unit, they're, uh, uh, sorry, per watt, they're not expensive, but per unit, they're very expensive. Uh, there is also things like organic uh, solar cells, but these are only four or five percent efficient, and as a result, it's a long way to go before they make it that gets anywhere. They're very, very cheap, but there's still uh, very, very low efficiency. And again, real estate has some value to it, and as a result, it's very integrated into the cost of how to use that. Um, so these are uh, of moderate efficiency. They work during the day. They don't work when the clouds are out, especially. Um, they don't work when it's rainy. So how do we change? Oh, I got to go over here. Sorry. So what do we do? Oh, sorry. Before I get there, um, the, there is a cost associated with these, and I mentioned the cost. Those are the cells only. You put them into a panel. You're going to build the panel. In fact, all of the balance of plant is probably a factor of two or three times the cost of the solar cell, depending on what well, how exotic you want to be. But this is the standard economics curve. As the price drops, then the market penetration increases. Currently, we're sitting here somewhere at around three and a half to four dollars an installed watt for these systems. So we're somewhere in this range here. The, the market penetration has started, but it's not as far along as this curve projects because the curve was done in a 2006 curve. But we need to drop the cost more or increase the efficiency or make the cells work longer. Uh, uh, and there are a lot of ores associated with that. So what makes up the value chain. Well, you've got the module itself, but you have to start with the basic material. You have to then have the components. You have to have the, the inverter associated with that. You've got to be able to do the installation, etc. And so if you look at all the numbers, uh, it's, the cell itself is, in this, in this case, the silicon cell is about 60 cents per watt, but by the time you add everything else up, it's talking about five, five times that cost. And so as a result, you have to integrate all of this into the product uh, itself. So uh, increasing efficiency will bring down the cost, as I said, increasing the uh, time of, of use will, in, will 
bring down the cost, etc. So let me get this over here again. So how do we reduce the cost even further? Now, why is the cost a challenge currently? Well, it turns out that there's things like natural gas and coal that are cheaper uh, to use and by ge and for generating electricity than solar cells. Um, and cheaper to use because the long-term costs in terms of what it does to the environment aren't integrated currently in the costs themselves. But nonetheless, they simply are cheaper. I can go out and I can get a, a gas turbine and burn natural gas and get uh, uh, and get uh, something like uh, 800, uh, let's see, let's do it, about uh, 70 to 80 cents a kilowatt uh, versus three or four dollars a kilowatt for solar cells. So the market doesn't doesn't work always. In places where there is hard to get electricity, for instance, on top of a mountain somewhere, where you've got to run uh, cables that are very expensive that may be uh, useful to be able to utilize solar cells. But nonetheless, if you want to increase, reduce the cost. How do you reduce the cost? Reduce the, the uh, production cost. Well, we saw what the components are that make up the cost of the cell. Uh, you can increase the efficiency. Go from a 15% cell to a 40% cell. You're increasing the efficiency by a factor of almost three, and as a result, therefore, the cost should drop by about that factor. Um, you can increase the time of operation, uh, you know, but we have weather and we have day-night cycles on this, on this, uh, uh, on the earth, and, and had my PowerPoint been working properly, you wouldn't have seen the bottom line here, uh, but you've seen the bottom line ahead of time. Uh, why don't we take and convert solar energy in space? Space, no weather, number one. And if you work it, either no day-night cycle or something you can work around in terms of day-night cycle. Uh, the biggest challenge, of course, is the fact that, that in terms of weather, as an example, in Houston, we have an average over the year of 5.3 hours of sunlight. Okay, that's usable sunlight in Houston. So, uh, and, you know, there, are, there should be something like, we would expect something around eight or 10 hours a day, a, a, a average a day, but that's not the case because of the weather scenario. So. Let's convert the energy in space and then somehow use it to be able to, to uh, help us with our energy costs. Well, solar energy from space, there have been a number of proposals for many, many years back in 1972, 73, there are proposals of, of generating electricity in space and, and uh, shipping it down to the Earth, essentially beaming it down to the Earth. So man-made satellites. Um, originally, the satellites were extremely large and expensive. They still are large and expensive currently. Uh, things that are, are something like uh, tens and hundreds of acres of satellite of solar cells, uh, and uh, that then is converted uh, in space to electricity. The electricity is converted to microwaves. The microwaves are beamed down to the Earth. We convert it back into electricity and utilized here as power. That's great. It's an interesting uh, a concept. Uh, no weather. And, if you do it right, let's say in, in, a, in a good geo orbit, there's no day-night cycle. Um, but there's a lot of uh, technology that has to go into that to make it really work. Uh, you've got to be able to have launch costs low enough to move all that mass up into space. You've got to be able to assemble it there into arrays. You've got to be able to uh, assemble all the microwave components, make sure you're beaming in the right direction, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not that straightforward necessarily uh, to do that project. Uh, and so even recently it's been, it's been reviewed by NASA in, a, in a, what's called a fresh look study in terms of how to, what to do with space solar power satellites. And there are new concepts, and you can just barely see that here. These are reflecting arrays, and the solar cells are sitting in this section, so you have large mirrors reflecting the energy to the, to the central, central region. That central region then has got, has got uh, um, uh, essentially uh, uh, increased uh, uh, solar flux and, and uh, generate then generate electricity from that and beam it down to the earth. Still an expensive proposition. Uh, the challenge that uh, that can get away maybe from this expensive proposition is the fact that we already have a natural satellite. Why do we have to make satellites if we have one already we can utilize? And in fact, the moon is in fact such a natural satellite. So why not thinking about using the moon as a satellite <clears throat> on which we can generate electricity with solar cells, and then in that way, beam the electricity back to the Earth, use it on the Earth, or in fact, use it on the moon. So, so moon benefit. Let's see. I mean, the moon has resources. We know that. Uh, in fact, we know now the moon has water, and a significant amount of water. Um, but it's got uh, a moon rocks, moon dust. They brought it back. The, from, uh, Apollo brought it back. We've taken some, of that moon, taken some of that moon dust and, in fact, reduced it down to its basic elements. Silicon, iron, titanium, aluminum, because all they're just oxides, they're just rocks. 
Um, it has also a smaller gravity well. It means if you want to make something on the moon and launch it off the moon, it takes you about one sixth the energy that it would, it would from the Earth. So you get much more payload for the amount of fuel, et cetera, that you have to use there. It's easier to get things off the moon. And the moon, as I said, is a satellite. So <clears throat> what about the raw materials that are there? I mentioned silicon, aluminum, iron, so this is Apollo 15 regolith, and you see silicon dioxide, titanium oxide, aluminum oxide, chrome oxide, iron oxide. Uh, I can't read that, but I think it's manganese. And this is magnesium, a calcium, sodium, all the way down, down the line. So there are, there are a large number of oxides on the moon, and these oxides have all the metals that, we ha that are of interest to us technologically. In fact, if you look at this, it's got uh, silicon, that's great because we can make solar cells out of silicon. Yes, ma'am. Ah, I'll get there in a second. So hold hold that thought, okay? Yes, the answer is we've thought about it, and no, you're wrong. I mean, sorry, you're never really wrong, but but we've thought about it. All right. So so a lot of material on the moon. Sorry, a lot of oxides from uh, from which we can make things like solar cells. Okay. So, uh, what else is on the moon? Well, you should know that the moon is an ultra-high vacuum. About 10 to the minus 10 tor. A tor is one millimeter of mercury. Um, uh, during the daytime, it's lower at nighttime. Uh, and you should also know that when Apollo landed and took off, it tripled the atmosphere of the moon. So, um, uh, it's a good vacuum environment. Uh, and that means that I don't need vacuum chambers on the moon. Okay. When we're talking about solar cells, I mentioned thin film solar cells. These are solar cells that are deposited as thin film layers. These are done in vacuum chambers so you don't contaminate those layers with contaminants that then prevent the solar cell from functioning. So I don't need a vacuum chamber on the moon. The whole moon is a vacuum chamber. All right. Um, and so in that case, because I like thin film materials, we could directly grow thin film on the moon without a vacuum chamber. So we have the materials, the silicon, the aluminum, uh, et cetera, that we need. We have a vacuum environment that we need. Why don't we just grow solar cells on the moon? Once we grow them there, the other thing that's important, I said that, that the moon has a lower gravity well. Well, you could take and, in fact, uh, use electromagnetic launch to get things off the surface of the moon. You don't have to have chemical launch because the G factor is so low. It's 1, 6 G there. And I'll come back to the electromagnetic launch in a second. You shouldn't be able to read that because that would have been covered up uh, in the PowerPoint. Uh, okay, so so here here here's the moon and space solar power. Um, we have raw materials. All we have to do is extract them. We have a vacuum environment, so we can vacuum deposit materials and make thin films. Why don't we make thin film solar cells on the surface of the moon? Okay, you can make them to use them on the moon. And in this picture here, we've got a, a colony or at least a base on the moon, which has n number of people and no, no less than three and no more than, say, 50 or so. They will need a significant amount of energy on the moon to be able to operate. And that energy that is the most principal one uh, is, is electrical energy. Uh, and as I've always said many, many, for many, many times, there's three things you need in space. Number one is electrical energy. Number two is electrical energy. Number three electrical energy. With that, in, with that in hand, everything else comes, uh, can, 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 be, can, be, uh, can be handled. Without electrical energy, you're, you're in deep doo-doo. So we could make solar cells on the moon to use them on the moon. You could also, we could also make solar cells to use that energy somewhere else or make them on the moon and move them off the moon and put them somewhere else. This is part of the space solar power scenario. So if we use the moon, what kind of solar cells should we make? I just said that there's a plethora and alphabet soup of materials that are available on the moon. Yeah. Um, since you don't have to deal with an atmosphere, and you know, an atmosphere absorbing certain frequencies of light, can you just retune the solar cells to be more efficient to not have Exactly to correct. Visible? Something called air mass zero. Air mass zero is there is no atmosphere to, to, to absorb the light, and as a result, you get a better black body radiation curve than that one with this very jagged, jagged that I showed you before, so you can better tune your solar cells for that. Um, in terms of current cells available, I said there's silicon, there's copper, indium, gallium, sulfide, 
There's cadmium sulfide, cadmium telluride, there's gallium arsenide, there's organic. Well, on the moon, there just ain't no organics. It's a little bit of carbon, but it's parts per billion, so forget about it. Um, in the list of materials, I should have pointed out, there is cadmium, there is sulfur, there's tellurium, there's copper. Uh, we're not, uh, there's small amounts of trace amounts of gallium uh, and indium. But um, let's look, and I think I may even have that in the next slide, I apologize. Do I? Yes, I do. Here it is. So here's the abundances on the surface of, in, in the, from the lunar uh, dust, from the regolith, which has been determined by Apollo, uh, from Apollo flight. Silicon, about 400,000 parts per million. Aluminum, gallium, one part per million. Arsenic, one part per million. Cadmium, three. Sulfur, 1,000. Tellurium, 200. So we could make cadmium telluride, cadmium sulfide. We could make gallium arsenide. We could make silicon. Uh, but the most abundant semiconducting material that we can that that, that uh, will utilize really is silicon. You got to process a hell of a lot of material to start talking about gallium arsenide solar cells or CAD, uh, CAD sulfide solar cells. So let's focus on silicon as the cells that we're going to make from the material that's there. How do you extract the silicon from the from the regolith? Remember, it's silicon dioxide. It's an oxide. You have to reduce the oxide, get rid of the oxygen. You can do it a number of ways. You can reduce it with carbon. You can reduce it with hydrogen, with fluorine, or you can do electrochemical reduction. Uh, our uh, uh, method of choice is, in fact, electrochemical reduction because you just need to heat, heat the regolith, the rock, up to melting point, strike electrochemical, uh, strike electrical arc, and you could chemically separate out the materials from that. Uh, it's, in fact, we're doing that with a collaboration with, uh, with, with MIT. And uh, the biggest challenge is to make sure that the anode survives for many, many, uh, at least months or years. But it's, this is a very doable and gives uh, adequate quality of silicon. We've, in fact, tried to make solar cells out of silicon, and it works. So now we can make thin film silicon solar cells on the moon. Why thin film? Because we're depositing them, at, vacuum depositing these thin films. We're going to grow them on the surface of the moon. Um, so here's an example of what this cell could look like. First of all, I need a substrate to grow on. Remember, the, the moon is lunar regolith. Regolith is a, is a, a, a dust-like material. Its particles are 100 microns in size or smaller. Uh, it's there because the moon has been gardened, gardened is the right terminology, for the past 4 billion years or so, i.e. it's been struck by meteors, uh, uh, micrometeor, uh, struck by, let's see, it's a meteor and, and a meteorite both on the moon because of the atmosphere, but nonetheless they've been struck by meteors of various sizes and that has pulverized the surface to give you this layer anywhere from a meter to 20 meters thick of this very fine powder. <clears throat> so, yeah, it's not a very good substrate, but you still need a substrate, okay? Uh, you'll need a bottom electrode for the, for the solar cell. you need a, a, a junction, so you need to dope the silicon. You need a top electrode, and the top electrode, if you've seen solar cells, there are fingers of metal on the top of the solar cells to extract off the charge because you can't block off the top surface with a metal layer because you block off the light, or at least a large fraction of the light. Uh, and then it's be good to have an anti-reflection layer, something that gives you the right index of reflection so it reflects much of the light back into the space. Um, and then you have to interconnect these cells. So that's the concept. Uh, we're talking about microcrystalline silicon solar cells. And the silicon solar cells that you buy in the market today are two types. There's amorphous silicon, and these are something like 8 or 9% efficient. And there's crystalline silicon. And these are the 15, 18 lab, uh, a lab species of 20% efficient solar cells. Um, they have large grains, almost single crystalline, that's why they're efficient. We're talking about microcrystalline silicon solar cells. Why? Because we can't grow single crystal um, uh, layers of silicon on a substrate unless that substrate is crystalline in nature, it has long-range crystallographic order, almost single crystalline. That's called epitaxial growth. That's how they do gallium arsenide thin film. You have an ordered, uh, uh, ordered substrate, already a single crystalline substrate. You can then grow on top of that atomically ordered layers of anything you want almost, but you have to have the ordered substrate to begin with. So there's no ordered substrate in our, in our, in our concept because I haven't told you what the substrate is yet. But we're saying, under those conditions, microcrystalline, they'll be a few percent efficient, five, seven, eight percent efficient. In a sense, we don't care because we're going to make these on the moon. We'll just make more of them. 
a lot of real estate there to work with, not a problem. So <clears throat> here is an example of what the substrate might be. We melted lunar regular stimulant, JSC1, and it turns out to be a, a, a melt into a very nice glass. The powder is the, is the regular itself, softens at around 1300, uh, melts 1500, low viscosity uh, at those, uh, those temperatures, high resistivity, okay? Two mag ohm resistivity, two mag ohm centimeter resistivity, very nice. This is a scanning electron microscope at the 310 uh, half a micron scale. There's just no structure in this at all. It's just a very nice glass. So here's a good substrate. It's a sheet of glass, essentially. Okay, not atomically ordered, but that's okay. That's how we're going to make our microcrystalline cells under those conditions. So excellent substrate. In fact, if we take it and we evaporate that that regolith, because you do when you melt it, it's got a partial pressure above it. Uh, when you evaporate it, the film you evaporate is mostly silicon dioxide. And this turns out to be a very nice anti-reflection layer. So you can use that as an anti-reflection layer on top of your silicon solar cell. So you can melt it to grow the cell, and you can also melt it to do the anti-reflection layer. Okay, but now, so we've assumed a silicon-based solar cell, thin film silicon solar cell, will extract the material from the regolith by this electrochemical process. Uh, then we need to fabricate these cells on the surface of the moon. We need some sort of a fabrication deposition tool to do this. So what does that tool look like? There it is. It's a mechanized rover called a cell paver. It's about a meter wide, about two meters long, um, of the order of 150 kilograms of mass, and it will it has uh, solar cells on here to give it mo to give it the motive power it needs to move. It has little uh, solar thermal collectors that use uh, that focus the sunlight to a small region to be able to heat up and melt the regolith, and as it moves, it lays, around, it lays on the surface of the moon thin film silicon solar cells, remotely controlled. Do you believe me? Sure you do. Here's an example. These are parabolic co collectors. They are connected up uh, with light pipes to, and you can see the ends of the light pipes here. There's four collectors, and you can see four beams of light coming out. You can take that and focus the light wherever you want. And in fact, uh, um, these are running at about 85, 87% efficient. So 87% of the light that you gather goes down the light pipe, comes out the other end, and you can use that to heat up whatever you want, uh, or at least illuminate whatever you want, and if it absorbs that light, it will heat it up. Okay, so we have a bunch of these uh, scheduled in here, and in fact, we have solar arrays that are moved because you want to be able to control your temperature, and you control that by blocking and shading off these little parabolic collectors. Um, for, uh, let's see, I had something come up here under PowerPoint. It's not coming up. That's here. Okay, sorry. So here's the way it'll melt the lunar regolith. Here are this fiber optic bundle. Each one of them has an output from one of the little solar collectors. It's hitting an intermediate plate, let's say a tungsten and tantalum plate, and that plate is melting a lunar regolith into a glass. So as the, as the cell paper moves along, it's melting the lunar regolith in front of it, into a glass onto which then that same cell paper deposits the bottom electrode, the NNP doped silicon, and the top electrode. So here's the scenario, which is supposed to go in as an animation, but it doesn't. Uh, so uh, here's the melted regolith glass, the deposit, deposition of a bottom electrode uh, of the NNP doped silicon, uh, top electrode deposition and anti-reflection coating, and then bus bars to interconnect everything. All that's done in one sequence as the crawler is moving along the surface of the moon, moving along very, very slowly. And the materials we use here are the materials that are available on the surface of the moon. Silicon for the solar cell, aluminum or iron silicide for the metal contact, um, and for a top contact, uh, either the silicon dioxide regolith or else titanium oxide, which is available on the moon as anti-reflection coating. And then the power grid is interconnected with either aluminum or or uh, iron silicide, or even calcium for that matter, because there's a fair amount of calcium on the surface of the moon. Calcium is a very great electrical conductor. We just don't use it here because it oxidizes so readily. No oxygen on the surface of the moon, don't worry about it. So, uh, okay. Now, what is it, how does this thing move? It moves about one meter squared per hour, all right? 
Now, that means it will fabricate about 65 watts per hour equivalent of 5% cell. We're being conservative. Uh, we assume uptime of 35%. There's day and night on the moon recall, so it's not 50% up. It's 35% up. We're being conservative again there. Uh, we can do about 200 kilowatts per year with one crawler moving along the surface of the moon. Notice that, that this is continuous cell replacement, and people have asked me, what about radiation damage or particle damage, micrometeorites hitting these cells, they're damaged. If, if you were on the moon and you had brought solar cells from the Earth with you, once they're damaged, that's it, they're gone. In our case, fine, they'll be damaged, they'll be covered up with dust, whatever. We simply go and make some more. I say simply, it's not that trivial, but nonetheless, there's a method for, for having either continuous amount of cells or, in fact, increasing the number of cells by simply having our crawler continue operation. So, you've got to have some way to extract out the regolith, because I wanted to, to, to the, the, our self paper to live for quite a long time. Uh, notice the, the spirit and opportunity on Mars have now been living for, what, six and a half, seven years almost? Well, one of them got stuck, so it's, it's dead because it's stuck, not because it, was, it had broken down. But nonetheless, these, these are, are moving quite well. And as a result, the lunar dust problem can be easily mitigated because I said it moves at one meter per hour. That's the motion of a minute hand. Minute hand? Minute hand. No, yes, minute hand, all the way around the clock once, right? Can you see? <clears throat> so, in fact, what, the reason it's so slow is two reasons. Number one, we don't grow very fast. Number two, you don't want to kick up dust as it's moving. So the slower you go, the better it's going to be. And if you design the wheels correctly, and if you will look at our wheels, you'll see they are designed correctly. Any dust generated is pushed to the outside and not to the inside. Yes, we're worried about dust, but I believe it's something that can be solved. So here's now the system that's going to make the silicon. So once we use up the load that we launched this with, they've got to refill it. So let's make some more silicon and we can refill it. Um, and uh, in making silicon, this needs a fair amount of energy. I said about 1,300 to, to start melting the regular 1,500 for a complete melt. Uh, if it's electrically driven, and this is, you need a, a fair amount of energy to be able to do that, and you're talking about something like a 10-kilogram load of, of uh, reactant in there. Um, uh, and that comes out to be something like of the order of a few hundred, 500, 800 watts. Well, that's a pretty large solar cell field to be able to fly up there, but... If we've loaded our cell paper with solar cells already, it can go and make in the first, uh, in the first month or two something like 10 or 20 kilowatts worth. Remember, it's 200 kilowatts per year capacity. So we're talking about 10 or 20 kilowatts in a month. Uh, you can then have this thing simply plug into that and use that energy that you've generated uh, with the solar cell to be able to run, uh, to run the, the, the processor. Uh, in addition to that, when it extracts out your silicon, your aluminum, whatever else we need, uh, it, it generates oxygen. Oxygen, you know, is useful. And therefore, if you collect the oxygen, you can use that for other things, for life support, et cetera, et cetera. So I've got two products I can sell in the moon now, solar cells, sorry, three products, solar cells themselves, energy, and oxygen. Yeah, the world, I think, chugging along through its rotating gas and solar cells. Are any of its processes also bringing oxygen? <clears throat> no. No, it has the raw material that's simply depositing elemental, silicon elemental, uh, iron elemental, uh, aluminum, etc. So there's no, not, no, no, none of it. It needs the raw materials. It needs relatively pure raw materials to be able to operate. Okay. So, <clears throat> here's the concept. Uh, less mass, less cost to the moon. One megawatt in about five years. Uh, to, to launch... One megawatt of solar cells to the moon right now would cost you about three and a half to four billion dollars, i.e. To, to buy them, to, to pay for the rockets, to pay for the launch, to be able to land them, to be able to em, uh, emplace them, etc. Uh, to, to, to launch the cell paver and a regular processor and maybe even a little site uh, uh, servicer here because uh, you, to be most efficient, you want this thing to continuously operate and have something run back and forth with refilling raw materials. To do that, it'll be about $350 million. So about one-tenth, sorry, did I do it right? Yeah, about one-tenth the cost of what it would be if you were to just launch everything from the Earth. Uh, 10 rovers gives you two megawatts. 
two megawatts is a hell of a lot of, of power capacity for something like a lunar base. Right? You're really talking about uh, our energy-rich environment for the moon. Uh, there's a lot of things that, want, that people want to do on the moon, put up telescopes, uh, do uh, uh, extract water from the poles to fill rocket ships, etc., etc. All that needs energy, electrical energy. This is where it's going to come from, I believe. All right. Well, remember, I said we're going to talk about 5% silicon solar cells. It turns out that we've done a study and some work to show that if we can increase the grain size, which is right here, say to between 1 and 10 microns, then we go up into the blue and green curves here, and for the thickness of the cell, we're talking about something like between 12 and maybe 14% efficiency. So if I do, a, say, a 2 micron thick cell, with a one micron larger grain size, I'm talking about now doubling or tripling my efficiency that I assumed at 5%. Right. This is something that we've been working on and we're getting close to it, seeing how we can improve the efficiency. It means making the grains larger. Remember, the grains are small because it's growing on this glass substrate. You have to process that to make the grains larger and increase the efficiency. So here's a way to go with a second generation of, of uh, pavers called cell paver two. Let's assume a 12% efficiency, a thin silicon, now we're talking about three megawatts per year per, per cell paper instead of 200 kilowatts per year. And now if I've got 100 of these things operating on the moon, I'll do one and a half gigawatts. One and a half gigawatts is a nuclear power plant. It's a coal fire power plant. It's a gas power plant. They're of the order of one gigawatt. So what, now I can, if I do this, I can take and use this energy anywhere I want in space by beaming it there back to the Earth, just about nine square kilometers of solar cells on the moon. That's a very small fraction of the total area that's up there. In fact, we had proposed at one time to make it do, do a, a lunar solar cells in the Mickey Mouse face and have Disney pay us for it. No one liked that idea. Uh -huh. Well, uh, th this is a five-year operation of cell pavers, and our assumption is we're going to have at least a five-year lifetime. Okay, so... Oh, no, no, I'm not there yet. I'll get there in a second. Sorry, I, I misunderstood you. Okay. All right, so, um, in fact, what's it going to cost to do this? Well, we've estimated about 30 tons of mass. Um, if you take 30 tons of current solar cells, that's about 30 megawatts. Take 30 tons of our mass, that's about 1.5 gigawatts, large factor difference. Okay. Now, that 30 tons is going to cost of the order of seven to nine billion dollars. That's a lot. Uh, a typical coal fired power, power plant will run you about, uh, about a, uh, a billion dollars per, uh, per, uh, per gigawatt. Nuclear is going to run up between five and seven billion per gigawatt. Yes, sir. What was your estimate? Uh, are you including launch costs or just power No, no, launch costs. In, 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 the, in the cost, uh, that's everything. And launch, uh, uh, PMAD, in, integration, interconnection, all that. Yes. All that. Okay. Can you um, that for uh, all emissions? Ooh, I have to go back to, to 1967 dollars. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's 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 probably com I mean it's probably comparable to what the current cost. The current costs are like seventy five thousand dollars per pound of the moon is estimate that people have done. That would be two areas, five dollars. Probably, yeah, yeah. Well, you could stage it with smaller ones if, if it's more cost effective in terms of economies of scale. If there are smaller ones, because you know, talk, we're talking about about 150, uh, you know, 200 kilogram objects. So I can ship them up at, at two at a time, or ten at a time, or a hundred at a time if we need to. <clears throat> okay, so now we have to think about how to get the energy back to the Earth. Let's say we want it on the Earth. So power beaming, not the first one to talk about this. Many people have discussed power beaming. In fact, the Japanese have a program currently 
uh, to be able to, to do power beaming. They're going to put up essentially initially 100 kilowatts, and they're going to go for one megawatt and then 10 megawatts. Uh, it's going to be a satellite system over Japan. Japan has no natural resources for all intents and purposes, and as a result, they want to get generate they want electricity from the sun as a result of that. Um, for for power beaming, uh, you put uh, stations on both sides, both limbs of the moon, so you can always get to the Earth depending on the day-night cycle of the moon. You'd have to have two times the number of solar cells made there, but you know, since this is a simply a mechanical process, we should be able to do that. The challenge is, in fact, the, the transmission efficiency. Uh, the projection is it needs some, at something greater than 70% for two reasons. Number one, there's a lot of heat built up. If, if you're talking about one and a half gigawatts and only 70% of that transmitted, the rest of the 30% uh, is in, in heat. Uh, so you're talking about something like, you know, fractions of gigawatt of heat to, to, to get rid of. Um, number one. Number two is the fact that the, the um, uh, I forgot what number two was. <laughs> Never mind. But that's one of the biggest problems. Uh, in, in terms of the, the, uh, oh, yeah. Number, uh, the current efficiencies, the record ones are about 55%. Electricity in, electricity out. Uh, not bad, but uh, not great. Uh, you want to be much more cost-effective, much more economic, and as well, you want to have a, a higher efficiency for transmission. So, in the, in the beaming, you'd have to have, as I said, uh, uh, this is the wrong picture, but that's okay. You have to have arrays that are actually, this should be a dotted array, it should be on the back side of the moon with the uh, microarrays in the front, and you can, you can con interconnect these arrays if you want with a superconducting wire, etc., that's a long time in the future. But you'd have to have some sort of retro director or redirector to be able to get all parts of the Earth from beam down uh, from, from, the, uh, from the moon. And for that, we've discussed something called uh, uh, HICE orbits, hybrid uh, electric impulse solar sail orbits, because the, the reflector or the transmitter here in space will act like a solar sail. So you balance the solar sail pressure with the... Uh, uh, with the gravitational pull, and you can have stable orbits around the pole to be able to do that. With orbits around the pole, you can get uh, most uh, regions of the Earth, either a north or south pole orbit in that case. Um, so the power beaming challenges. Uh, with microwaves, you have to have a large transmitter and a large receiver. Um, a, because you don't want to concentrate the microwaves too significantly. Uh, it may be a problem. They are quite ubiquitous currently. I mean, we all have microwaves floating around, right? They're, they're, they're sitting here. Um, and you want to leave them at a, le at a level that it becomes not too, dis too disruptive to society. Uh, <clears throat> so that's a problem because you have to have large rectennas, large transmitters. Uh, and again, only mo uh, moderate efficiency, 55% efficiency in this case. So that, there's a, some challenges to be solved there. Large beam spread and, and low efficiency. One could use lasers to transmit the energy. You can convert and you can electrically, I mean, lasers are currently work on electricity, right? So, so uh, a laser beam, very focused, don't need large receivers for that. You can use, in fact, solar cells for receivers that are tuned, so they're, so they're receiving efficiency can be very, very high, 85%, if not higher, 90% almost. The so transmitting efficiency is low. Lasers are not very efficient. They only work at about Maximum 35% for the best ones around. Typical ones are in a, in a 15 or 20% range. So that's even losing a, lot, a, lar a larger fraction of the energy. And there's a challenge here because you're so dense in terms of energy density, you may miss your mark by pointing and you'll burn out some village or make a hole in the earth or something like that. <laughs> that's a real problem. And the other part is because we're on the moon, we have to have two solar cell fields, one on the front, one on the back, because they have to have one always in daylight so you can transmit, uh, and the microwave uh, transmitters will be always on the front because one side of the moon always faces the Earth. Okay. Um, so that scenario from the moon has got some challenges. Large the receiver transmitter because the moon's far away. The closer you go, the smaller becomes the transmitter and the receiver. Yes, sir? You can talk about what's happening on the Earth side. What is the rectenna Okay. The rectenna on the Earth side is uh, typically of the order of five to seven kilometers in size. It is simply a gauze, a grid. Uh, the Japanese have done a two-year study where they had uh, pigs and chickens and uh, rice and something else, grain growing under there, and found no impact on, the, on animals at all at a level of less than 25 milliwatts per square centimeter. 
which is the OSHA level, and found some benefit to the plants growing because they seem to grow a little bit more robustly in that environment. So as long as the energy density is relatively low, you're okay. And 25 uh, milliwatts per square centimeter is what OSHA says doesn't hurt things like airplanes and, and people. <clears throat> That's why they have to be very large, because you have to have a low density of, of energy coming down. Uh, but also the distance gives you that, that factor. Uh, because that distance is a certain formula that says you have to have a certain product between the transmitter size and receiver size, and if the receiver is small, the transmitter has to be large, or vice versa. The transmitter is small, the receiver has to be large. And large means the product of those two is usually of the order of something like uh, 50 or 60 kilometers. So, so instead of having everything on the moon, why don't we look at the fact that the moon has a low gravity well, and if we make things on the moon, it's easy to launch them from there, send them to GEO, and have a satellite in GEO now made from lunar materials. Remember, we have aluminum on the moon. We have silicon for solar cells. So why don't we make silicon solar cells, aluminum grid work, and ship them all from the moon into space by electromagnetic launch? Electromagnetic launch requires a rail system, requires electricity and magnets. Well, we have electricity because I just put a couple of megawatts of solar cells on the moon. We have a, a, electro, a, a chemical extraction of materials. So I, I can extract iron from the lunar regolith. It's the easiest to extract. I can make iron rails quite directly. So I can use the resources there to make the launch uh, process to be able to get things electromagnetically off the surface of the moon and ship them to GEO, where now they can be assembled into a satellite on GEO. So make the solar cells, but make them in a frame because you've got to be able to lift them off the surface of the moon. Remember, they're, they're made on this melted regular glass, just about three millimeters worth of glass that we've melted or so. So it's got to be melted onto a frame. So there's got to be a frame in place first. We can make an iron, an iron or an aluminum frame, put it in the regolith, paste solar cells over that, and then take that frame and then launch it. Whoops, there you go. Launch it uh, over to space and integrate it into a into a, a solar array out at GEO. Well, I've got a rectangular frame, and this is a, a, a hexagonal frame. We can always fix that uh, as a function of technology development. The point here, though, that this is only about 8 to 10 percent efficient, maybe 14 percent efficient. That's a far cry from the, say, 40 percent you can get with the exotic technologies, but they've got to come from the Earth. They're not necessarily going to come from the moon. So, um, so the microcrystal silicon scenario, we can rapidly make these things, or else rap rapidly. We, we can make all the interconnects. We can, there's an abundant amount of material there, silicon, as well as aluminum, a uh, good packing factor for launch. Disadvantages, you need, it needs to be robust enough to be able to launch off the surface of the moon. It means it has to have some structural strength. So we have to make this grid that, is, that cells are sitting on a limit structure, uh, has some structure. Uh, again, and the, the support may be somewhat complex to fabricate a grid structure to be able to grow the cells on. And we're only talking about, say, 10 or 12 percent efficiency. So there's some challenges there. Uh, what about crystalline silicon? We could, in fact, grow bools of crystalline silicon on the surface of the moon with this Trokowski method. This is something that was, that was done in space on the Mir space, sorry, on the Mir space station, but before on, um, Skylab, thank you, thank you, uh, where they tried to grow uh, crystalline materials with less defect in them and less grain boundaries because it's in a microgravity environment, don't have the Marangoni flow that, that to complicate the crystallization process. So yeah, great, put one of these units on the moon. You'd have to bring it there. You can't, you're not gonna be able to build that, I don't believe. Uh, <clears throat> but you have to then, after you grow the bulls, and they could be much larger now because you're in micro G, Right now, you know, that we're making silicon wafers that are, uh, that are now, now they're 16 inches in size. They were 12 inches in size. So the bulls are this big. So you, you could see if you make larger ones because of the micro-G environment or milli-G environment on the moon. Um, you have to still cut and polish them. You have to diffuse the junctions, attach electrodes, assemble it into, uh, into an array and orbit, and you have an increased efficiency. That's all possible and all doable. What are the, what are the challenges? Um, advantages, sorry, good efficiency, a nice robust thick uh, uh, silicon uh, material, abundant raw material, uh, large crystal types of the milli-G, but you have to have the infrastructure in place on the moon to do that. The, the Trokowski method is slow, it's weeks to grow a bull, you need slicing and polishing, 
Uh, you have to do the dopants, et cetera. So it's not that straightforward. What else is left? Okay, we, I mentioned cat sulfide, cat telluride. These are easy to grow. They're grown on glass right now. They're grown on plastic right now. Efficiency is 15% or so. Uh, so that's great. Uh, glass substrates are good. Low temperature, it's a low energy to make these things. Disadvantage, you still have to have a mesh to support them in some way when you grow them on the moon. Um, and you don't have much cadmium there. You need to process about 2 million tons of regolith per gigawatt. 2 million tons, that's a lot of regolith. You have to have an infrastructure to do that. That's something that probably we're not going to have. You need a lot of energy to run that infrastructure. Okay. I mentioned the gallium arsenide based stuff. This is the ultra high efficiency stuff that is 40% efficiency and higher. That's great. You have to have individual ovens that individually evaporate gallium and arsenic and indium and phosphorus and, and et cetera. Um, and we do that in the lab every day. It's in fact been done in space. We had an experiment back now, God, 10, 12 years ago called the Wakefield facility that did do this epitaxial growth in space. Um, high efficiency, uh, robust, so you can use silicon as a substrate. Um, but again, there is not much gallium or arsenic there. Again, you're talking about processing millions of tons of regolith to extract out this material. Not the way to go. Okay, so what do we do then? Uh, silicon, low efficiency microcrystalline, but it's easy to fabricate. Same crystalline silicon, higher efficiency, um, but you, you have increased complexity, which you can't read here, increased complexity of the, of the process. Wow, this is really goofed up, sorry. Uh, cad telluride, cad sulfide, uh, moderate efficiency. Again, uh, you have to have a low material availability. You have to process a lot of materials. And stable gallium arsenide, high efficiency, complex, low availability of materials. So we're stuck with microcrystal and silicon and simply make these, make a lot of them and ship them to space. That's great. So now we have a way to do that. But let's look at something that I want to identify here as materials availability on the last couple of slides. All right. uh, this is the earth materials uh, that have been extracted in 2004 and the world reserve. This is the log scale and it's in it's sectors of, of, of 10 here, right? So um, things like gallium, indium, cadmium, germanium, all these are, thing, are materials that you use to make solar cells. We make them on the earth. Okay. So this is a this is a challenge for those people that say, well, I'm just going to make my solar cells here. I'm going to ship them into space, and I'm going to put them, assemble them up there into a, in, in a power satellite. I don't need the moon for anything. Okay. Well, the challenge is that we're using some significant, not insignificant fraction of the total amount of world reserves. In fact, if you go and look at the world reserves and how much of uh, uh, power generation you can get in solar cells using all of those reserves, right? With silicon, it's about 2.5 terawatts. Remember, we said we'll need another 10 to 15 terawatts by 2050. Silicon could not cut that total amount because of the fact that we have to have silver for contacts right now. If you develop new contacts, as an example, you may be able to go much higher than that. Or if you use amorphous silicon and zinc oxide, you can go much higher than that. But still, there's a limited amount of material available to make these solar cells here on the Earth. Cadmium telluride, tellurium is low on the Earth. You can do about 20 gigawatts only. Right? Copper indium gallium sulfide, indium is low, low uh, availability. Again, 20 gigawatts of these solar cells. Remember, we got 6 gigawatts of of wind turbines here in Texas all by itself. Uh, these are these uh, uh, disensitized cells, and and uh, and uh, uh, these are very low because of the fact that you need indium also in this case as well as uh, some tin. Um, in the three fives, the the very uh, exotic ones, uh, germanium substrates are used currently. Again, 20 gigawatts. If you go with something different in the substrate, you may get up in the four or five gigawatt range. What this says, though, is focusing on terrestrial resources and solar cells for the Earth, we don't have enough material in our known reserves to do that just with solar cells. We're not going to get 10 to 15 terawatts within the next, uh, what, uh, 40 years or so 
by using Earth resources. We're going to have to go and use resources elsewhere to do that. Yes, sir. Now, go ahead. Before you get there, if there are a lot of questions, I'll just go to my last slide. Then we can do. Okay. Yep. Right. And I want to know what they extrapolate from this to the first person alive before now. And by the time they die, they're hungry. That's, you know, 21 of us. Yeah. Do we, do we have a hook at 26? No, 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 no. I mean, the, the point being is if we want to bring the rest of the world up, I mean, as I say, the, the slide that I could, the second slide I had, I couldn't show the rest of the world where there's dark regions of the world. Um, if we want to bring the rest of the world up to a minimum of one kilowatt uh, per person, right, then we need this extra 12 to 15 terawatts by 2050, looking at the population growth as a function of time and the need for energy for the population. Oh, no, 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 because the population will continue to, be, to, to grow. But, but, but there's, there's a data point at that at the 2050 that we're saying we want to have everybody have at least a thousand, one, one kilowatt of energy available to them. Right now, they say one third of the Earth's population has no electrical energy available to them. So that's the kind of a, uh, a, a, a milestone we want to try to hit. It's going to increase after that. We can't stop at 2050 with, with 20 terawatts total. We're going to have to continue increasing that population. Right. Right. And that's correct. And that's correct. And that's why when we're talking about renewables in general, you know, they're only a fraction of a percent right now of our total energy mix. In electricity, they're more like 3 or 4% of, of our energy mix. But we're talking about the fact that, that I think the U.S. U.S. Current electrical production, I have to get the number right, is probably around, of the 10 or 12 tera, terawatts we currently generate, we generate about a, a fourth of that, okay? So we're generating two to three terawatts of electricity. That's two to 3,000 gigawatts. In terms of the installation of solar cells in the U.S., it's only of the order of 400 megawatts. So we're, we're off by factors of 10,000 right now in terms of the energy that we electric energy that we use and what we generate with solar cells. Again, wind is only about uh, a about total of about 10 gigawatts nationally, maybe 12 gigawatts nationally of the couple thousand that we are using currently. So we've got a long way to go to offset all that stuff. And this sense says that we just can't rely on the materials on the earth to do it with solar. Yes, sir. No, this this is kind of the known reserves. Now there may be some unknown reserves. Okay, this is the same argument people use for oil, right? I mean the known reserves are now, but the reserves have increased over the past fifteen or twenty years when we thought we we're going to be running out of oil twenty years ago. So this is the known reserves. There may be more there, but of the, what we know, that's where we're at right now. And with those known reserves, then we have this, these numbers. Okay, let, let me finish up with the last slide because it's getting late. So, so lunar power satellite, what's the future of, of, of space-based solar power? To feed the Earth and to feed space in general, okay? We can fabricate solar cells on the moon from lunar resources. We can use that energy on the moon, or we can beam it back to the Earth, okay, from the moon. Or we can fabricate the solar cells on the moon ship them to geo on some relatively weak satellite or low mass satellite that's easy to put up there from the earth and integrate them into a larger solar power satellite and as an example uh the one I, the picture i showed you had big reflecting mirrors focusing the sunlight down to a, a smaller patch of solar cells those are just alumin aluminized aluminized mylar typically or aluminized material we could just as well make those out of uh, are melted regolith glass covered with aluminum. They'd work great as a, as a mirror. Perfect. So both of those uh, possibilities are, are, are currently, uh, uh, could be in play. The material availability challenge is one here that we have to face on the earth. And that means we may need to start talking, talking about using materials from elsewhere, not just from the moon, from asteroids, etc. if we want to aspire to these 
uh, um, the energy levels that we're talking about in the future. We just don't have enough uh, of our organics around to be able to use them for energy for a long period of time. And if we do, we're going to continue polluting everything around us. So we have to find additional ways of doing it. Nuclear is great. That's one way of doing it. But there are other ways that we have to focus on. And that, this means if we're talking about solar, it's, it's one of those ways we have to be able to generate materials from elsewhere outside of our Earth to be able to do uh, all the solar cells we need to be able to generate the, the 15 plus terawatts that we need by 2050. Yes, sir. Any estimated the share of availability on the moon? Um, yeah, and not total, total availability, but parts per million we know. And, and you know, the simple things that are around there, uh, the silicon and the irons and the aluminum, and the, there's a whole, whole bunch of it. And there's a lot of that on the Earth. That, that, that's not the material that we're looking for. We're looking for cadmium and tellurium, uh, gallium and arsenic, uh, silver, etc. And there is not much of that on the moon, frankly speaking, but there, there probably is much more of that in the asteroids. Uh, and, and mining asteroids is something that people have talked about and have focused on. In fact, there's some business plans put together to do that. Uh, when Will that happen? Don't know. But it, we may have to focus on that area downstream to be able to pick up some of these additional uh, additional kind of materials. Um, Mars is is uh, is also uh, reasonably good. We have no materials measurements from Mars. There've been, there've been uh, no no sample return from Mars. The expectation is it's got a lot of iron oxide. It's red, uh, uh, and be, beyond that, it's probably not too drastically different from either the Moon or the Earth because the the Moon is not drastically different from the Earth. Um, but uh, we just you know know how to dig better in the Earth to find things. Uh, so uh, Mars is a possibility. Uh, for this technology, Mars is not going to work very well because it's not a vacuum environment there. It's a very low atmosphere, but it's not vacuum. Yeah, but, but, but materials, yeah, mining materials is something we're going to have to think about. Yes, sir. is I, I, I haven't been sharing anything with anybody. I was going to set up lunar lighting and power and sell it. But, uh, uh, but no. Uh, number one, on the moon, you can't own anything. Okay? There's, a, uh, there's an outer space treaty that says that. There's a lunar treaty that the U.S. never signed and uh, Russia never signed and Japan never signed. So that's been signed by Zambia and by, you know, Tasmania and whatever. Uh, this space faring country. Uh, but nonetheless, um, uh, uh, you cannot own anything on the moon, but if you put something there, it's illegal for someone else to impact it. So although I can't own a piece of land, if I make my solar cells there, I can, I can say you, the Japanese, or you, whoever else, really can't destroy my solar cells. You have to leave them alone. Although I don't own the land, they, I have to leave the, the installation alone. So it looks like from your diagram of the moon, Looks like there's a skinny equator going around the moon and probably two sites that are probably the optimum places for the Earth. And so that looks like that would be a land grab right there. Sure, except I just said that nine square kilometers is 1.5 gigawatt. So I'd need 900 square kilometers for a terawatt, approximately, from 700 kilometers, whatever the number comes out to be, right? 700 square kilometers is not very large. Okay, I like actually I like 900 because I can take the square of that. It's 30 by, by 30 by 30 kilometers, nothing. So, so I don't think there's going to be a challenge in that. And and you're right. The, the best place to do this is on the equator. It can be done in the pole. It can be done anywhere you want. But the best place is the equator uh, to do that uh, for the moon because it's almost lying in the ecliptic, the orbit of the moon. So therefore, it's good. This the maximum sunlight scenario there. So, um, uh, but there's a lot of land there and. Uh, and therefore, I don't think there's going to be a, don't foresee an immediate challenge. Has anybody made the Japanese projected what the oil cost is going to have to be before this stops being a research project? And, you know, well, I, yeah. Right, right. And, 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 
And I don't think anyone's gone through and done an extensive economic model of that. I mean, we've done a little bit of a little bit of modeling, and as I say, that modeling has gone to the extent whereby uh, one I mentioned the 1.5 gigawatts uh, would be around eight to nine billion dollars for the first for the first unit. Now that's making a hundred cell pavers. If you make a thousand cell pavers, the cost that will drop. Uh, so e economically, in terms of in terms of the the cost, the economies of scale, you're going to see that the number dropping. Nine million, nine billion dollars per gigawatt transmitted as an or received, let's say, because 1.5 generated, let's say one, one, one received, is not that far from the cost of the nuclear power plant currently, which is around five, six to seven, depending on who you talk to. That's right. That's right. So, so the expectation is that number one, our our fossil fuels are going to become much more expensive to generate electricity as a function of time. Uh, we're going to have some, some, some decrease in cost of installation of our system on the moon. Uh, and so therefore, uh, you know, economically, you're not that far off. Factors of two are not, are not a real, a, a big challenge if you're talking about, you know, a 40 year time period or factors of three even. It's not factors of a hundred as an example. Okay. It's not even factors of 10 that we're talking about here in terms of cost. Yeah. The cell paper can build part of that. Lunar transmitters are, are essentially dipole antennas. So they're metallic elements, and people have made thin film dipole elements. And so the, you can build those just the way you build the solar cells. You've got some transistors behind, beyond that, behind that, and they're not very exotic, and they can be made the same way. Transistor simply is a PN junction, not, not much different than, than what's going on in a solar cell. So the elements can be made. Uh, the assembly of these into an array becomes a bit more complex because you've got to have the, the, tra the, the transmitting antennas within the wavelength of each other. Otherwise, you're going to get them out of phase. You're not going to have an a, 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 a in-phase beam, and you're going to have dispersion of the beam. So the, the mechanics of, of assembling this thing becomes much more complex, but you can make a large fraction of the materials there on the moon. Yes, sir. Uh, your argument was using uh, silicon paste, which the other one said it was most abundant. Right. Um, and that argument is correct, by the way, just so you know, before you start. <laughs> Sorry. Well, Sorry, go ahead. There are still a few uh, actual you know, samples. Are there, are there possibly middle rich areas that we don't know about? Or the here at this? <clears throat> we, we, we've, had, we've had Apollo mat material from the highlands. Uh, from Namare, uh, there are, you know, uh, half a dozen, half a dozen, I think so, half a dozen different areas that were sampled. They're all within this, the, I mean, they're plus or minus, you know, 15% of what I showed you there. So instead of 35% silicon, it's 30% silicon. But silicon is the most prevalent material, uh, material silicon dioxide. Uh, iron's next, and aluminum, iron, and aluminum, iron and aluminum and titanium are next after that. There's a lot of it there. Yeah, the, the challenge there is the digging process because to dig you have to use a lot of energy, number one. Number two is the regolith, as I said, it's anywhere from a meter to 20 meters deep. So you, that's been gardened. So you, if you want to dig down 10 meters to try to find something different than the regolith, that's going to be a, a fair amount of work to do. Now, there are some outcropping of rocks, as an example, at, the, at craters, etc. Okay, uh, and maybe those may be somewhat different because if you had a if you had a meteor strike the surface, then you've got the meteor material floating around there somewhere. So that could be looked at and investigated, and that may be interesting because there may be you know some metallic meteors that have struck, and as a result, the metal is already much more prevalent there and be easier to use. And we may need some of these metals that, like platinum based. You can use platinum for solar cell contacts; it's beautiful. It works great. It's just expensive as hell here, but it may be if it's there sitting at a meteor uh, uh, site, then it's direct to use. Yes, sir. You showed a lot of numbers about, you know, various numbers of these rovers, you know, or the pavers to go up there and the cost and the way along that. So then there's also a lot of generalization about the infrastructure needed to harvest materials, process them, and all this sort of thing. Um, but I guess you have to have all that in place first, right? So the rover feed up there to get no. No, no. The, 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 way, the way we projected the following, and in fact, in those numbers, we had 
included this little site worker, this little uh, taxi that would run between the processor and the cell paver. And if there are 100 cell pavers out there, there are 30 processors, and this guy's running back, or several of these are running back and forth between them. They've been integrated into the, into the, into the concept. The, the concept is the following. So you set up the first one. The first one's loaded with raw materials, loaded with enough materials to make of the order of 20 kilowatts capacity. Okay, so it can go out and make the first 20 kilowatts. Along with the first one, you land the processor, and you start the processor, you, you, you position the processor near where you start. You start making the processor near where the processor is positioned, interconnected to the processor, and the site worker can inter interconnect that robotically. Once you've got your 20 kilowatts made, or maybe even 10 kilowatts of that, then you can start using your processor, using that energy. So you're building your own infrastructure as you, as you continue. The biggest problem that you have to have there is something called the power management distribution system, the PMAN, uh, where, which has to be something, a box brought from the earth. It's going to be plugged in to the thin film wires uh, that are, are, are coming from the solar cells, the thin film ones that you made coming from the solar cells. That's the biggest, the biggest, most, most complex part of it. Uh, the rest is really, you know, uh, continuously operating and moving and, and kind of self-replicating almost. I guess I was envisioning some sort of big factory on the moon. And, you know, nope. That costs a lot of money and a lot of mass. It's more something like smaller scale. Right. These are 200 kilogram blobs the size of this table. Okay, and I can put you know, three, four, five, six, eight, ten of them in one rock. Yes, sir. Do your cell tenders efficiency increase or decrease if you go to larger vehicles? Um, uh, uh, the, the, uh, we've chosen this, this one meter size because we know that we can get enough solar energy in where we need it to melt the regolith uh, to appropriate depth to be able to do the, the, the glass. That's the highest energy consuming part of the process, right? I think making them larger, we, we, we figured there would be a, more of a challenge. You have to make your, your, your cell paver much more massive and much more, uh, have many more of the para parabolic flexors on there. So this, it's kind of a trade off. Real small is not good and real large is not good. You know, it's the Goldilocks yeah, scenario. It's about 40 of them on an altair random. Well, there's, 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 oh, there's mass and there's volume. Right. Okay. Uh, I wasn't sure volumetrically if the offer could accommodate for you, but even if it could, that raised the question that we need to go with that smart size and the larger and be more efficient. Yeah, it, it actually probably is the, the, the one meter we think is, is kind of the one meter wide by a couple meters long is about, is about the, the current optimal size. Make it larger. Doesn't, we can make it better. We can make it faster, et cetera. That's where the Mount Mark II comes into play, but it, it's not larger and physically significant. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. And Mr. Mall has a man component of it. And the real great scope was has tires and is engineered to not pick up the mm -hmm. We, we've minimized human in, in intervention here, okay? Uh, but if something breaks down, uh, you know, I don't think our robotics are smart enough just yet to fix it. Uh, they can't fix my car. I've got to fix it myself. So, um, uh, so that's that, but there will be required some man tending or man uh, oversight here. Uh, but, uh, but principally, this is all operated telerobotically. Uh, uh, or automated ma manner, because all I have to do is steer around the big rocks. Actually, we, we position a small little plow-like thing in the front, so if there are, you know, small little rocks and that haven't been pulverized, and move them out of the way, uh, and smooth out a, a nice path to melting, and just steer around the little rocks and big rocks, and you just pay the moon. Yes, sir. You mentioned that the cell will have to five-year lifespan. Have you been designed to grid layout and <coughs> No, no. The, the, the cells themselves will have probably a 20-year lifetime. The machines, we're shooting for a five-year lifetime. And I say, you know, Spirit and Opportunity are now working six and a half years or so. I know the, the, the area taken up by the is going to be pretty insignificant compared to the surface area. You're talking about the two important sites for transition to space and back to Earth. Uh, you know, given the geography, have you, have you given thought, you know, are we talking radio layout? Uh, we haven't, haven't given much thought to that. Uh, let me just kind of clarify. 
Maybe I can go back to back up picture somewhere here if I can find it. No, maybe I can't. I've got enough time. Sorry. Um, uh, the the equatorial regions are of interest for laying the solar cells down. They're the most the easiest to do. But anywhere on the limb is where transmitters have to be. So you know, I'm talking about a swath that may be a couple hundred miles long on each limb, and I don't care where it is uh, on the limb. Why on the limb? On the limb because then you know, a set of solar cells behind you is, is available to the, to the site always. And, 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 and so you, you really have continuous energy generation from the moon that way. But, uh, but uh, you know, this, this equatorial swath may be, may be, you know, a couple hundred kilometers wide, for all I know. Uh, are you going for high density in the close area close to the transition site to reduce I'm sure the farther away you get from the transition site, the more. Yeah, yeah, exactly correct. I mean, and you are you're right on that point. How do you if something breaks? You have to have some kind of pack for repair robots or something like that to get to campus. Once you take a pack, you can't tell them what the pack. Right, right, right. And and that takes more thought than we've put into it at this point in time because you have to have the topology of the moon to be able to identify exactly how you're going to lay this thing out. They say you're going to have to maneuver around larger objects that are there because not, not the whole moon is not simply a perfectly flat plane of regolith. And in doing that, you're going to have to understand how you how you end up um, uh, continuously making these these uh, these uh, arrays and having in connections work. Now, probably there's very little servicing of the arrays. As I say, if they're damaged by micrometeorites or if, uh, hot spots or whatever, we just take them offline and make some more. And there are blocking dies to allow you to do that. That's in the design. So there's no need to go back and try to fix uh, an array. So you don't have to have any, any access to it that way. Just have to make sure you don't cross over lines and short out lines as you're laying them down. But that's something we have not really gone through and modeled. I've talked enough. Ah, yeah. And, and, and the, okay. So, so, so what I can, I can draw on here. I can draw. So if I look at, Sorry, this is a post record system. If I look at efficiency as a function of radiation dose, so here's efficiency. Here's radiation dose. Um, the curve looks something like this. I can't draw it very well. <laughs> so, so here's silicon. So up here, it's sitting at, you know, 15, 18%. A little bit of radiation damage to it drastically cuts down the efficiency. But we're sitting down here at, uh, so I, I didn't draw it to scale, but we're sitting down here at 5, 8, 10%, where already you've got a reduced efficiency. And if you add some radiation damage to it, the efficiency doesn't drop drastically. It decreases more gradually as a result. So, so it'll still run for 20 years, and it may have a, a starting efficiency of 8% and end efficiency of 3%. Uh, instead of a starting efficiency of 15% and an efficiency of 15%. So the solar flares, you've got protons, electrons coming off the sun. You may have some damage to these systems. Uh, uh, they'll they'll dam. Well, let's see. Sorry, I'll I'll, I'll stand corrected. Protons won't do much. Uh, they're a high enough energy to probably go right through our thin film cells. Okay. Uh, electrons don't damage it significantly into the into the uh, megavolt range, and that's not what, what solar flares have associated with them. Electrons could be captured. Um, we could have the same problem that Canada had in 1997, wherever it is, that the, the whole grid went down because they had a flood of electrons coming in uh, from a solar flare. That could happen. The PMAD, the power management system, has to be able to handle that in some way or other. Okay. Monthly, almost like in <clears throat> right. Right. And the beauty of this is that it's sitting on regolith, and regolith is not is not a, a solid surface. It can move and expand and contract as needed. So we've looked at that in some detail. It turns out that the expansion and contraction is less is less than you have in a, 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 a in is sorry is equivalent with the kind of substrate that we have here, the regular substrate, to what you have in the typical day here in uh, on the Earth. In other words, day night cycle. Those are pretty well similar material. Uh, no, I, I, I stand corrected. Those, we, I had someone look at. We didn't think there was a challenge to it. But, but, uh, but uh, um, the bottom electrode and, uh, and the 
the, um, the silicon, the bottom electrode and top electrode are very thin metal. Uh, so you can expand, expand, contract them as need be without delamination. That's been shown uh, 150 degrees centigrade temperature range with aluminum on silicon. Um, so I think we're, I think we're going to be okay. I think that's enough. You guys have yeah. got to go home or something. No other questions? Thank you, speaker. And then also I want to just make a quick announcement. Uh, next week, our speaker is going to be David Talent, and he's going to be talking about the 2007 uh, Chinese ASAT test and the implications on the impact of space warfare on the um, low Earth environment. Uh, so. Uh, please try to make it to that. It'll be the same time, same place. And this talk will be available on our website uh, probably within the next couple of days.